Welcome, welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, the president of Spiritual Awakenings International, and I welcome you all to our SAI Presents event. So hello and welcome. Bonjour et bienvenue. Herzliche willkommen. Grüezi. Hola et buenos dias. Buongiorno. Bon dia. Aloha and Kiora. <laughs> I just welcomed you in eight different languages because Spiritual Awakenings International is truly an international network. And uh, we are currently in 60 countries around the world. And we are just delighted at how SAI has grown in the last year and a half. I'd invite all of you now to take a moment now and type into the chat where you are Zooming in from today, where you're uh, joining us from in the world today. Our speaker today is from New Zealand. I am from Toronto, Canada. Uh, Robert is from Oregon. So please type in where you're Zooming in from so we'll know where you're joining us from. And now I would like to... Um, turn it over to uh, the Vice President of Spiritual Awakenings International, Robert Baer, who is going to give some opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Kaysan. I'm just looking in the chat box, by the way. Uh, we have New Zealand, San Diego, England, Washington, D.C., Arkansas, North Carolina, Washington, Thank you all for attending this. This is truly an international event and thank you. Uh, on behalf of uh, Spiritual Awakenings International, again, I'd like to welcome you. We have a great presentation for you today. Uh, Kirsty is all the way here from New Zealand as Dr. Kazon indicated. And uh, I wanna talk about the uh, format of the meeting, but oh, first of all, Couple of notary, a uh, couple of persons that are. Uh, we ha we have Tamara Richardson, uh, one of our advisory board members, uh, in on the audience. Um, Francisco Valentin, who's on our Espanol SAI Espanol, and we had Dr. Peter Fenwick sign up, who's a renowned researcher and and, and lecturer. He's on our circle of honor. We're just really delighted to see all these people. Everybody sign up from all over the world. But our format of the meeting, again, everybody is going to be muted except the speaker. And at the very end, we're going to have a question and answer period. And if you would like to put your questions in the chat box, we will have uh, our secretary, Linda Truax. Uh, she will moderate the question and answer period. And um, that's the format that we're gonna use today. And I'd like to remind everybody that all these presentations that we make for SAI are free, but we are donate, we, we're donation-based. If you feel that you'd like to donate to Spiritual Awakenings International, please go on the website, hit the donate button and anything that you wanna contribute would be greatly appreciated. And now I'm gonna turn this back to Dr. Kaysan. Yvonne. All right, thank you, Robert. Uh, it is my great pleasure now to introduce our speaker for today, who is Kirsty Salisbury, who is joining us all the way from New Zealand. We have at least one other person who is Zooming in from New Zealand, so I'm glad to hear that. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted that we have Kirsty with us today. Kirsty is a uh, New Zealand-based speaker, podcaster, coach and funeral celebrant. So she's doing all sorts of awesome things. She's also an NDE experiencer as she I'm sure will be sharing with us. She had a near death experience at the age of 12, which has affected her entire life. And it made it made her uh, want to focus on expanding the conversation around death and the afterlife. And she uh, runs this wonderful podcast, and I hope some of you've had a chance to listen to it uh, and watch it, the Let's Talk Near Death podcast, where she interviews all sorts of people from around the world with stories about life after death, NDEs, and other STEs. She is 
a member of the Spiritual Awakenings International Advisory Board. So we're very, very happy to have her as part of the team. She is also the co-founder and co-leader of IANS Down Under, which is the Spiritual Awakenings International Affiliated Group. And she is going to be a facilitator for our SAI Experience or Sharing Circle. So she's very, very busy. She's also the founder of the Let's Talk Near Death online community. And she's host of the Auckland Death Cafe. She has three wonderful books, A Life by Design, Let's Talk near death, did I say this wrong, and dying well. I'm sure she'll correct me if I did any of the books wrong, but I'm very, very delighted to introduce Kirsty Salisbury, who is going to be presenting on Let's Talk Near Death. Kirsty. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is wonderful to be here, and yes, thank you, Dr. Yvonne, Robert, Linda, Tamara, to the board, whoever is here tuning in and to all of our audience, thank you so much. I am, I feel very blessed to be here and I'm very excited because being here today really aligns with my vision, which is to expand the conversation around death and near-death experiences. Now, as Yvonne mentioned, I come from New Zealand, so I'm sitting here in Auckland today on Sunday morning. The future is good. It's a bright, sunny day. Well, it's, it's a bright day. It's getting a little bit cloudy there, actually. And I just really love that we can come together on a global scale to share these stories. So I'm going to share my screen with you. I'm going to take you through a quick presentation, and then there will be some for some Q&A. I love interactive sessions. So if you have any questions, please pop them in there. I would love to have this as a growing conversation. I can sit here and I can talk to you. And if you're familiar with my podcast, there is always something that I've got to say. But I'd rather hear from you and hear what it is that you want to get out of the session with me today. So a very big thank you for being here. I'm going to start, I'm going to start just before my near-death experience in my life. There have been some experiences probably before I was before I had my near-death experience where you know, I look back on these experiences and I wonder what, not, but I'm going to start a little bit closer to my near-death experience because that gives a really good footing of everything that, that came after that point and leads right through to the work that I'm doing today. So I'll start when I was, this is me, I am 11 years old in these photos, I was a competitive gymnast and everything in my life revolved around my dream to be a high level and so this was down to what I ate where I was my friends group everything I did revolved around to be honest and I had my eyes set on do you think I could ever get to the Olympics anything like that whether I actually could have I have no idea but I believed that I could so I trained and I trained and this was more important than my work. It was my life. And one day when I was, I just had my 12th birthday. So a few weeks after these photos were taken, just had my 12th birthday three weeks earlier. And I spent my whole lunch times outside playing on the, the jungle gym, the bars, cartwheeling around, walking on my hands. I was just always active to the point that my parents joke about how I couldn't walk in a straight line because I had to go over something or up something and walk around the walls on my hands. And I was just very active. I think, think you'll understand what I mean by that. So it was lunchtime and I was at school and I was on these bars. They were metal bars. I don't know what it's like over in the US for you, but we had these chunky metal bars in, in the school playgrounds and not a lot underneath them. There might've been there might have been a little bit of grass or actually just worn away where people's feet had been running. And, and I was spinning round and round the bars because it was my happy place. That was what I was enjoying doing. And I could remember doing some trick, trying to learn some new move on these bars. And I hit my head and the bar went smack straight into my head. And I got a bit of a shock and I got off the bar and I stood there and pulled myself together and I didn't think too much more about it 
went back to school, went back to my class, carried on my day thinking, oh, I'm going to have a bit of a bruise there the next day. It's going to be a bit sore for a little while, but I didn't think too much about it. The next day I woke up and I thought, oh, I feel a bit tired. Again, didn't really think too much about it. However, it was within 24 to 48 hours of me hitting my head that the pain started to really kick in. And I started to get really lethargic and really tired. But I had the national champs coming up at the weekend. So this was on a Wednesday and I had the national champs coming up on the Saturday. And so I thought, I've probably just been training too hard. I've probably been pushing my body too hard and now I'm tired. So I'll take a few days off before my competition and everything will be okay. So I went to bed, I got an early night's sleep, went to bed early. And then I woke up a couple of hours later and by this stage, everybody else in the house had gone to bed. The house was completely quiet and my room was dark and it was probably somewhere around 12, 1 a.m. I actually don't know. And I remember thinking, wow, my head hurts. My head hurts so badly. And I was there on my bed and I was thinking the pain is here. It was this pinpoint pain up in my head and it was excruciating. And then I thought, oh, it feels so good. I have to get up. I have to go to the bathroom. And so I tried to get out of bed and I collapsed on the floor and I couldn't get back up. And I remember pulling onto the bed leg, trying to pull myself back up onto the bed because I needed to get to the bathroom. And I kept just falling down on the floor and the pain was there, it was excruciating. And I was just thinking, what is going on? I don't know what's happening. And then my mother heard the noise. She'd heard me crashing about trying to pull myself up on the bed leg, trying to get back into bed. She came in and she was probably ready to tell me off. It. So I was, I was a bit of a, bit of a monkey when I was a child. I was, like I said, very, very active. If she'd got up and I was quite possibly practicing gymnastics in the middle of the night, it probably wouldn't have been that unusual. I was all over the place. I was, I was a very active child. So she came in and she was probably quite ready to tell me off. And then she realized that I was collapsed on the floor and she couldn't get me up. She was trying to get me up, finally got me up and she carried me and she helped me get into the big bedroom, which was next door, which had a big double bed in it. And she stayed with me for the night. I said, I don't feel well, I've got a headache. And I probably wasn't making too much sense still hadn't connected that anything was actually really wrong just thought oh I've got a migraine I'll sleep it off and I'll be okay so we get into the big double bed and she falls asleep and I'm lying there in excruciating pain and I hear a voice and the voice says to me do not go to sleep and I thought that was very unusual and I'm thinking why can't I go to sleep but the pain's so bad so I try to stay awake and I can't stay awake I fall asleep and I fall very, very asleep. The next morning, my family wake me up. So my mother wakes up. I'm out to it. I've now actually gone into quite a day, but they don't realize that. They're trying to wake me up, get me ready for school, realize that I'm not going to go to school because I'm still not feeling well, and then start to panic. Because a little bit later, if you can't wake up your child who hasn't been very well in the night, that's got to be a little bit scary. So they couldn't wake up they phoned the doctor and the doctor came around and he did some tests he checked out my vitals and he freaked out and he said call an ambulance we've got to get this girl to hospital let's go let's go get me off as fast as possible they actually phoned for a helicopter that's how urgent it was the helicopter couldn't get there in time so off we went in the ambulance and I was rushed straight into emergency surgery now I don't really know anything that was happening in this physical realm where I was, was there was the voice telling me not to go to sleep. The next thing that I remember is that I am in this place of nothing, absolute nothing. There's no noise, but there's no silence. There's no light, but there's no dark. It was just empty, but it was dark, but it was just void of anything. And I'm in this place and I'm thinking, where am I? I don't know what's going on. And over my right hand shoulder, I could hear a voice. And the voice was saying to me, connect with me, squeeze my hand. And I thought, that's a weird thing. And I recognized the voice, my father. And so I go to try and 
Tan because I can hear that he's concerned, but I'm not concerned at all. I'm confused, but I feel great, actually. I feel confused is the only thing that I can remember. So I try and connect with him. I can't find my hand to be able to squeeze his. I can't find my body. And I'm in this place with nothing and he's behind me. So I'm trying to then turn to look for him. I can't find him. I can't find anything. I'm just, uh, I don't know words for this. I hear this quite a bit with near-death experiences. There are no words. I can't connect with him. I can't find my body. I am just there. And I hear him pleading, pleading and pleading. Can you come? You've got to connect with me. And I can't this feeling of overwhelming responsibility this overwhelming responsibility that if I can't connect with him in some way then life as we know it would not be okay my future would not be okay the future of the world would not be okay and I'm very aware how crazy that sounds as I'm saying that right now I always feel a little bit funny to tell you that but that's actually what happened I felt this overwhelming feeling of things won't go as planned, things won't be okay if I can't connect with him. So I literally give every single thing that I have to connecting with him. I'm trying to find my body, I'm trying to find him, I'm trying to connect with anything, but I'm just in the space of nothingness. And I can remember going, well, this is it, that's my life over. I'm going to have to actually sacrifice myself to connect so that everything's going to be okay. And I count down, I remember pulling myself together going, okay, this is it, this is it, three, two, one. And I just funneled all of my being, all of my energy into connecting with him who I couldn't find through a body that I didn't have. And at that point, it was like, I felt like there was a twitch of a finger which I can't explain because I couldn't connect with fingers or hands. And there was a booming, booming, silent white light. And I'm aware that a booming silent isn't really a thing, that they're two opposite ends of the scale. Again, words can't explain what I experienced. I'm there and there's this glorious white light. And I'm going, where am I now? And the confusion, you know, I did have a lot of confusion. It's setting in. And this white light is just, oh, it's just beautiful. It's embracing, it's warm, it's, it's just incredible. And I'm there and it's kind of like the closest thing I can relate it to is on a really hot day if you're lying on the beach or if you're lying outside and the sun's shining down and you're just like, ah, oh, this is so good. You feel warm, you feel good. That's the closest thing that I've got is that I was there and I was kind of just basking in this light. And then I noticed that there's beings around me. And so I'm thinking, okay, this is crazy. Now your natural reaction when you want to look at someone is to look at their face or to focus in on, on them. You look at their eyes or their hair or you, their face. So I start to do that. It was my natural reaction was to look at these beings. And I noticed that they didn't have any faces. They didn't have any features. They were there. They, were, they weren't 2D. They were 3D. They were, yeah, they were moving. They were alive. And yet I couldn't see any faces. I couldn't see any features to them. It's like they were silhouettes. And so the harder I tried, the less I could see them. And I can't explain that either. So they're all around me and I'm thinking, where am I? Who are these people? I love this. This is amazing. I was very happy to be there. I could feel vibrations coming. It was like waves and waves of, it was like the love coming and it would come kind of like waves at the ocean of, of this love and this light. It was alive. It wasn't just, I was in light and it did nothing. It was moving. It was encompassing. And I start to count how many beings around me. Now, I, th I think, think there was a seven of them. So I'm going to say there was about six to eight of them. I can't actually be sure. But again, they're around me and they're clapping and they're cheering. They're celebrating. And they're celebrating me. And I'm going, but I just feel the 
often I couldn't connect with my father. I tried to connect with him. Boom, the white light. Here I am, there's these beings, and they are so happy that I'm there. And I get the feeling that off in the distance with these waves of love that are coming, that there are millions and millions of other beings. And it's all good. They're all happy. It was, I struggle because it sounds like I've got a really big head, but it was all about me there and they were happy for me and I was there and they were celebrating and welcoming me and I'm getting more and I'm starting to really focus on whether I can see them I want to know who they are because I so I'm looking at them and the more I look at them the less I can see them and then boom I'm back and I'm waking up and I'm in the medical care unit of Auckland Hospital and I've got tubes everywhere. I've got um, machines going off. I've got all sorts of things happening. So that was kind of the spiritual side. That was the beginning of the spiritual side, I should say, of what happened for me. So in the physical, I'd had the voice tell me not to go to sleep. I'd fallen asleep, gone into a very deep coma. My parents couldn't wake me up in the morning. I'd then been rushed off to the hospital straight into surgery. They'd found uh, what we call an AM on my brain so up here in my brain I'd had it's an arterious arterious malformation which basically just means that the blood vessels hadn't formed correctly. it means that the blood flow was compromised the ends of the vessels it, yeah I can't explain the medical side of it but it meant that they hadn't formed correctly just like if you have a deformed part in your body it's not quite right. So this is from birth. It's very much like an aneurysm, except an aneurysm grows and develops through life. This was from birth. So they, they found out that I had this in my brain. My blood vessels had burst when I was in my bed at home. This is probably when I woke up and I had that excruciating pain. The blood vessels had burst, so I'd had a brain hemorrhage. So now my brain was bleeding and they'd rushed me into surgery and they'd opened me up, given me brain surgery yeah, I flat the operating table. So I don't know at what point during my surgery or during this whole thing that the experience happened, but I flatlined on the operating table and then they, they brought me back, they resuscitated me, brought me back. And then I flatlined again a second time. And there was a bit of a panic. They brought me back and it was that they realized these AVMs, there was more than one. They realized that they had, so they took some out they took out and it was years and years later that I found this out I thought they'd taken just a tiny little piece they'd taken a golf ball size of my brain out and they got me stable stable enough to bring me back and keep me back but they aborted the surgery they said this surgery is far too dangerous we will lose her she will not survive so they took out about a golf ball size realized there's more in there and brought me back, got me stabilized, and then I woke up. So I woke up in the critical care unit. So when I woke up, oh gosh, there we go. When I woke up, there was all sorts of things going on. We'd found out that the problem wasn't solved, the problem hadn't been fixed, that I was going to need more surgeries to fix this, and that I was at quite a high risk of this happening again. And they said, if it does happen again, I would die. So I woke up in critical care unit with tubes everywhere with a beautiful surgical scar. And you know what? I woke up and I felt like everything was perfect. My life was absolutely on track. And then I look at me and these tubes connected everywhere and I'm going, life is great. This is what was meant to happen. So I'm there. The doctors and nurses are coming in. And they're very happy to see me. They are very, very happy to see me awake. This is quite a few days later, by the way, when I've come out of the coma. It wasn't the next day or anything, probably about five or six days later. So I've come out. They're very, very happy to see me. And they're trying to explain everything that happened. And I'm thinking, do they think I'm an idiot? Do they not understand that I know everything that just happened, that I was there? You know, I experienced it. So, of course. So I they were speaking down to me at the same time as the nurses and people coming into where I was and trying to talk to me and support me as I'm waking up out of many days of lying still I can see my parents and they're getting in the car to come to the hospital so they've had the phone call 
I can see what's going on there. I can see what's happening in the current room. And that just seemed completely normal to me. It wasn't till a little while later that I was thinking, hang on a minute, I could see two different things happening at exactly the same time. And I was aware that I could actually connect with multiple places at the same time. And again, I struggle to put words to that. I struggle to explain it because it's very, it's very difficult. So my parents come in and then it's that road to recovery. And I'm thinking, what about that experience? I don't necessarily want to be here. Like, yes, life is great. This feels perfect. I feel like everything is exactly as it should be. But what about that light? What about those people? I want to go back to the party because that's what it felt like. It felt like this massive party just for me. And so I was kind of half wanting to go back, but half wanting to stay. And I kept thinking, I've got to talk to my dad because my dad was alive at the time. And this is what so unusual about my experience now that I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of near-death experiences it's very common to meet your family members in a near-death experience but not ones that are living so I've only met a couple of other people who've had living people in their experience so I'm thinking I've just got to talk to him and find out whether he was there did he ask me to squeeze his hand what was going on there so finally I get up the courage a couple of days later because I'm also aware that now I have a bit of a brain injury maybe I'm not thinking straight truly medicated like I'm I'm a little bit loopy to be fair so when I should talk to my dad and say hey dad were you there were you squeezing my hand were you talking to me apparently he wasn't he said he couldn't go in the room because he was so impacted he was so devastated by what was happening and I understand that because I think about this and I think Yes, I've been through this adventure. I've been through quite a lot of stuff on this. There was a lot of trauma that came after this experience. But if I, I look at my daughter now, my little girl, and she's nearly 12, she'll be turning 12 in about five weeks. And I think if anything happened to her, I just don't know how I'd cope. I don't know how I'd get through that. So I can understand that it was too much for him. And, you know, that kind of pulls on my heart even right now as I'm saying this. So he said, no, he sat outside. But there was another family friend who came in when I was in the coma and they made an allowance for her to come in because it's only the immediate family that can come in while you're in a coma in critical care. So they made a special allowance to come in. She would come in and sit by my bedside and hold my hand, as you do, as you see in the movies, as you do. And she would tell me all about her trip that she'd been on. She'd talk about all sorts of things that had happened. So my father says, do you remember her coming in and talking to you? I said, no, not at all. I remember you. And he said, well, I wasn't there. And that was kind of the end of that. I didn't really talk about that as I was going, but it was real. It truly happened. So I wasn't quite sure what to do with that. I parked that. I parked that for 27 years. That's how long, because I just did not know what to do with this experience that I'd had. There was... Uh, pre-internet times I was a young child I was I just turned 12 I was growing up in a very atheist family and so there wasn't the exposure to belief systems there wasn't the exposure to life I had no concept about what I believed life I had no perspectives on the world I was just and kind of unexposed in a way I suppose and so I'm there lying in the hospital bed thinking everything I've been brought back for a reason. So I need to get on with this life and I need to truly live this life. So I started with all the good things that come first and I started with pizza. So this, uh, this, really, this will be a few weeks after I'd woken up. I'm there. So I'm now paralyzed down one side of my body, which is why I'm kind of slumped over a little bit. I... I was paralyzed completely down the left side of my body. So my surgery was on the right. They'd taken out the golf ball size ABM. They'd found more of them. They were dying me as a walking time bomb. Like that was literally what they said to my parents. She is a walking time bomb. She could blow at any moment. And so I was now living this life where I wasn't allowed to raise my heart rate. I wasn't allowed to get excited. I wasn't allowed to raise my blood pressure. 
And we're talking about the kid that couldn't walk in the straight line without jumping on her hands, climbing over the furniture, walking up the walls. The child that was just so active because my passion was my gymnastics. And I'm still going, I can still get to the competition. I can still get to the nationals. This is really important. And they were saying, no, no, that happened last week. Devastated, but to be that child that is super, super active and being told I have to basically sit still, giving me pizza was probably a good thing. So we had pizza night on Friday nights. Everybody would come in, including our best friend family, who the lady had come in and held my hand and stories with me. The double family would come in and we would have pizza Friday nights in the hospital. And I loved it. It was so cool. And from there, I really just decided that I had to take control of my life because I could stay how I was, which was paralyzed. And the doctors were saying, we don't know if you're going to walk. We don't know what this is going to look like. I was having some pretty interesting seizures at the time. So I now had epilepsy. I had reactions from medication and again, paralyzed. So I can't even go to the bathroom by myself. I'm completely dependent on other people for everything. And I'm lying there thinking, this is not the time to feel sorry for myself. And it was like I'd been given some kind of, you could call it a download. It was, it was something that I bought back, which made me determined. And it gave me this feeling of everything's exactly as it needs to be. So let's not dwell too much. Let's get on with this and let's really live life. So I started on this recovery journey. Remembering, though, that I'm this walking time bomb, that I've got these things that could go off at any stage of my head. My dad would come into the hospital and sit in this chair next to me. And I made this decision that every day that he came in, I would show him one new thing that I couldn't do the day before. So I started to build in these habits, which actually have transformed my life right up until this day. These habits of tiny little things, which I brought into my life to try and build. I couldn't do anything. And so I think it was that I managed to, with my right hand, brush around my left side of my mouth because it was all hanging down, dribbling. It was numb. Um, there was all sorts of good stuff going on there. So I made all these tiny little habits in life where I started to really progress towards getting back on my feet. Because as far as I was concerned, I'd come back for a reason. You can't get that close to dying. And then just come back and live an average life. So I was like, whatever an amazing life for me looks like, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm all about living life to the full, like today, living life to the full. And that doesn't really mean jumping out of airplanes. It doesn't mean doing big adventure things. Living life to the full and fulfilling the most incredible life can be sitting still and meditating. It can be helping somebody if they're in need. It can be giving out it can just be doing all of these great things that tug on our hearts and I think we all have these and I can talk so much about that but I'll come back to my story you can tell I'm very passionate about how we live a very full and meaningful life so here I am I've got these things in my head and from the moment from this picture onwards it was a bit of a journey learning how to move my hands little twitches turned into opening my hand turned into moving up and down my arm turned into learning how to move my toes, then my leg, then standing up, to walk again. And I'm not going at this stage because it's too dangerous. I am at home lying on a couch most of the day by myself, completely bored watching daytime TV. But it's what if that was my journey. That's what it was for me. And then they say, well, we've got to find a solution, but we can't operate again. So the next solution was to jump on one of these big things and to fly to the other side of the world we weren't sure whether I'd get through the flight because of the what do you call it like the compression the the pressure in the cabin so we jump on a plane with my mother and I we fly to England where I'm going to have the very early stages of stereotactic radiation therapy because they can't go in to operate so what they're going to do is go in and they're going to use radiation and I think it was 14 beams all at the same time are going to go down and pinpoint onto where these AVMs are in my brain with the idea that they can basically nuke them in my head and that they would break up, dissolve, and then they'd pass out through my body, through my sweat or going to the bathroom or however things pass through our system. 
So I jumped on a plane, went over to the UK, had this. Now, this was in its very early stages. Today, it's pretty commonplace. Today, it's called gamma, gamma knife a knife therapy I believe and today it's not really a big deal but back then they gave me a couple of options they said you need to wear a frame because we are going to bolt you to a table we can stick the frame to your teeth or we can bolt it into your neck and all I could think of was Frankenstein and I was thinking I don't want to be like Frankenstein I don't want to have um, scars for the rest of my life on my neck so I chose the teeth option so this is me after we flew to the UK. Here I am. I've got this beautiful hat on, which is covered in padding. And this is literally connected to my teeth. They then bolt me to this table. And this is one of the machines where they're going to nuke me with all of this radiation into my brain. They've got all sorts of things. There's a whole team around me. This was a two-month treatment over in England. And it was very early stages. So you can tell was terrified and here I am trying not to raise my blood trying not to get my heart rate up trying to live the most calm delicate life that I can when everything in me is like let's go let's go let's go do life I'm back let's go so I had therapy it took two months in the UK thankfully it was a success I know people that have had this treatment where it wasn't a success but again I'm like well it's part of the bigger plan. Of course, it's a success. So, so grateful, but also I live a very, I live in a way which I expect things to happen and I'm grateful as they do, but I think it's sort of the outlook plays a lot on what comes out of life for us. So here I am, I'm having this. I have a great time um, afterwards. So afterwards, I can now walk, I can start to do things. Now they're saying, okay, you can raise your heart rate a bit you can raise your blood pressure a little bit, you can get a little bit more active. And I cannot wait to go back to gymnastics because somewhere in me, I still believe I can do all the things that I used to be able to do. The brain hasn't quite connected to the body and realizing that my left side still doesn't work. I mean, it's great. Today, it's, I mean, it's a happy story. Today, I've probably got back about 95%. So I can do things. I've lost the... Um, fine motor movements in this hand so you if you've seen me on videos I'm always moving one hand this arm just sort of sits here my left side is constantly numb but I can do everything I need I can go to the gym I can lift weights I can run I can do anything I can walk the dog I can drive a car I just don't have these fine motor movements to be able to do individual things like that so it was a great time of learning how to really get back on my feet I'm starting to think I can run a little bit I can jump I can start to hanging out with other people my age because it was quite a interesting age for this to happen because this is the age where you're getting into life you're becoming a teenager you, everybody was going off to high school they were all going off to school camp and I was literally going off to hospital and I remember going what a contrast where is the fun in that I want to go to school camp not to hospital um, it was yeah a lot went on there. so I learned how to walk I learned how to do all these good things and I started to just get back into life thinking I want to, I'd shut down my near-death experience so frequently. It was parked over here and buried. And so I left that there and I went on and I started to do life and I started to get really active. And I had a lot of beliefs around myself, a lot of beliefs that I was embarrassing because I can quite easily fall over spontaneously, which I still do because my leg will either give out or I can't feel it and I'll just trip over. I started to feel like I was a burden because my family had to put so much care into me that I was an issue. So I carried a lot of this stuff along as I did. And I started to overcome this after I'd had my surgery and got back into the place where I could walk and run and live in more life where a lot of people didn't necessarily know what had happened to me. And I tried. I became a personal trainer. I started to get more active and I started to live this life. If I can do something, then I want to do it really well and I want to do it better than everybody else to overcompensate for what I'd been through. And again, there's a whole story around that. But basically, I started to live life and I always felt this beautiful spiritual connection. I always felt like there was something there when I came out of hospital, when I was able to anything the first place I wanted to go was 
because I represented my experience with church. That was all I knew growing up in an atheist family. I didn't quite know what to do. So I went along to church and I became very, very passionate about God and spirit and connection. And it's been such a beautiful journey. Things came develop as we go on. I then started to really start to pursue what is the of how do I live a meaningful life? How do I stay in this lifetime? I'm driving my car. This is probably about six or seven years ago. I'm driving my car and I listen to the voice, the voice that I talked about very early on where I said that I heard a voice saying, don't go to sleep. I listen to that voice all the time. It comes back to me. I realize that this voice is within me. It's bigger than me, but it's, in, it's within me. And as I learn how to connect spiritually, I learned that this voice plays the massive part in me connecting spiritually. I'm driving and this voice comes and it says, I want you to go and interview near-death experiences. And I'm thinking, what the heck? I haven't even shared my own experience at this point. I haven't talked about this. I have buried this so deep. I told my husband that I'd had a near-death experience, but that was possibly the only person because I just didn't feel like I needed to share this with the world. I just felt like, if I can run away and hide from this whole experience, then that's safe. So the voice says, you can go and interview near death And I'm thinking, oh my, what am I going to do? And I start thinking for like the bare minimum, how do I get away from this? How do I get out of this? So I thought, well, I can make a questionnaire and put on like maybe five questions. And I could send that to some people. I was going, I don't even know people that have had a near-death experience. But if I go find one of these Facebook groups, or if I go find somewhere, I could find these people. Because I, I wasn't in the circle. I just didn't know where they were. I'd kind of dabbled in irons. I'd kind of dabbled on Facebook group from the side. But I'd hidden this so deep that actually I just didn't know where to find people. So then the voice comes back and it says, no, I want spoken interviews. So I'm going, oh, no, okay, now I'm really in trouble. And I know from this voice, I lived by this voice my entire life. It never gets me wrong. It has taken me on some very wild adventures. Whether you want to call it God or higher self or inner self or source or whatever you want to call the voice, it's there. It talks to me. And I believe that we all have this voice. I don't think we need to have a near-death experience or actually transformative experience to hear the voice. I think what we need to do is we need to sit and we need to connect and we need to meditate and we need to take time to live a spiritual life. And I think that the voice shows up whenever we do this. So I'm there. It's saying go do audio, video interviews. I then dabble in a Facebook go, oh my goodness, I feel like a nutter, but would anyone be prepared to share their experience with me? And I'm thinking I'm going to do one or two interviews and then I can tick that off. I've done what the voice said and I can go back to my safe life. And I had a massive response. I had a whole bunch of people come back to me and I'm thinking, where have these people come from? Like, it's like everybody came out of the woodwork. I could not believe what was going on. So they all came out of the woodwork. I started interviewing people and I'm thinking, great, any minute now I can shut this all down. This is going to be the end and it's all going to be happy. But then they started going, well, I've got a friend you could talk to. Would you like me to introduce you to this person? Or I'd get an email saying, oh, so I heard you just interviewed this person. Well, I had an experience too and I'd be happy to share with you. So this thing started to grow wheels and I'm there going, what is going on? I'm going to have to talk about my own experience at some time. So I start doing these interviews. I keep doing these interviews. Six years later, I'm still doing these interviews. And it is the most amazing, fun, exciting part of my life. I love my work. It has just been such a blessing. And if I hadn't listened to that voice, I would have missed out on everything. I'd be living that safe life. I'd probably be doing exactly what I was doing back then, feeling like, okay, let's go. Because I've always felt like, let's go. I mean, I still kind of feel like that. Now, I just want to say, if you've had a near-death experience or a spiritually transformative experience or any kind of experience at all, that doesn't necessarily give you a free pass to knowing what your purpose is. It doesn't give you a free pass to understanding what you need to be doing with your life, where to put your focus, put your time. I'm still like, I wonder what I'll do when I grow up. You know, because I still feel like that little kid when I'm 12, I still wonder what I'm meant to be doing with my life. And yet people email me going, oh, it's so good. You've got it all sorted out. You know exactly what you're doing. And I think if only you knew. So 
just want to put that in there that just because we have these experiences doesn't mean we know very much. But what it does mean is that we know that if we connect to source, if we connect to spirit, if we take time to be still and push all of the noise, that we can get some of the messages coming through, that we can start to hear what we're meant to be doing. Now, it's really interesting that I was driving my car when I got this big direction, because if we're not sitting still and we're not doing that, we'll either get a dream or we'll get something while we're driving our car or when we're in a state when our brain is kind of not very active, because it's almost like autopilot when you're driving your car. There's actually a term for it, which is highway hypnosis, when we go into autopilot. When we're asleep, our brain, you know, the amount of activity in our brain shuts down a little bit which means that we're more receptive to these messages, we're more open to it. So it's so important that we connect. So I start to hear, I then start, I, I'm thinking, okay, I need to give this a name. So I start up the Let's Talk Near Death podcast because I'm thinking, well, we're talking about near death. That was all I had what I was doing because I was only going to do it for two or three episodes and I was going to shut it down. So that was great. So I started up this um, podcast, which is still going. I have interviewed so many people there's a community behind it now I'm having the time of my life and the research is really starting to come through like I'm starting to learn all these themes I'm starting to learn about out of a hundred near-death experiences what are the key things that come out what are people seeing what are they experiencing and there's a whole conversation piece around that I'm happy to address some of that in the Q&A but, you know, my research into these experiences just skyrocketed because when I started, I had no clue. I hadn't even my own. And then people started writing into me going, we know you've had one of these because you accidentally mentioned it in one of the episodes. I think I referred to something and I'm going, oh, what am I doing? Why did I have this up there? So people started going, we know you've had one. Can you share yours? So I waited, gosh. I think it was about 18 months. I can't be sure because I know it was around, I released it as the first episode of the year. Now I can't remember which year, a couple of years back. It took me a little while to get, I thought I could actually share this with the world. And I was really, really scared. And just want to say, if we're scared, sit down, connect. Is this a good fear? Is it actually fear? Or is it something that we're feeling led to do? Because quite often spirit will prompt us in things which terrify us because that's where the growth is. And people ask me, why do we come here? Why are we alive? From what I've seen through the experiences that I've researched through the other work that I've done, we come here for a learn. It's a giant playground where we come and we can learn and we can choose things and we can have a very physical experience. So often if we're afraid, there might be something behind that. Not always, but I would say just check in and connect with that. So I was afraid. So I started the podcast. I then shared my own experience, terrified. And then that made me feel like I'd put roots down, like I was actually in this. So I started to do the podcast more. That's where things sort of moved on a little bit. But the whole time I'm asking all these questions because I'm learning so much. I'm asking questions around death and dying and death experiences where we stay dead. Because I always thought, what if I'd stayed dead? What do you experience? So I started to ask all these questions and I asked things like, why don't we say it? Because I remember as a five or six year old sitting on the floor in our kitchen and it was a lino floor and I had this little blow heater and the heater was in front of me. I was sitting there, I was getting ready for school and my mum was over in the kitchen making me something for breakfast. And I was there in front of the heater putting on my school uniform, which was probably miles too big for me. And started to question my mother about where my grandfather was because I'd never met my grandfather and she said oh well he's gone away and I'm thinking well where's he gone he's gone away and she eventually said that he had died and I had no concept about death I'm a five or six year old had no concept and then she said oh but we don't talk about these things and I learned in that moment that we shut shut down the conversation about death now maybe this was just in my family Maybe this is what it's like here more than the US. I'm not quite sure. But over here, we don't really talk about death too much. It's changing now. But I remember being so confused that we don't talk about death and going, but everybody dies. So I've been asking questions about death forever since I was five or six years old. 
saying, why don't we say it? So maybe this is a cultural thing as well, but we talk about passing away. They've passed, they've lost, they've moved on. You know, there are so many phrases that we use rather than saying, well, so-and-so died. And some people resonate with this. Some people go, oh, that's just so abrupt and painful. I understand that. But I've asked questions for a long time. Why don't we just say it? One of my other questions was, why are we so afraid of it? Because I had no fear of death whatsoever. Whether I did before I was 12, I don't know. But this is another thing that comes out of near-death experiences is that most people don't have that fear of death. Most people are quite happy to go through life because they feel like death is a transition rather than an end. Now, I've many different topics within the near-death podcast. Many of these, we've got talking about near-death experiences, but then there's all the subtopics that come out from that. And our coming up season is all around after-death communication, which is so exciting to me because I'm learning loads. But my father has actually died now. I had a beautiful, beautiful experience with him after he died. And he came and he said to me, I'm okay. Don't worry about me. I'm okay. It was amazing, actually. And I thought, wow, that's so incredible. So why are we so afraid of dying? Is it because we don't know what's going to happen? Is it because we think it's going to be painful? All these questions that I've been asking, why are we so afraid of death? Because experiences, the loss, sorry, the fear of death seems to have been lost. It comes right down. I then start asking questions like, why do we fight to keep people alive? You know, if I had died on that operating table, that would have been seen as a tragedy. That would have been seen as a great loss, as a failure, as something which potentially shouldn't have happened. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that in that white light where it was amazing, that would have been completely fine with me. So why do we fight to keep people alive? Why is death bad? Why is death the enemy? And in hospital settings, it is seen often as a failure. Perhaps that's different over here, but we will do anything to keep people alive. We'll medicate, medicate, surgery, medicate. We will do whatever we can to keep people alive. I then start asking, can we prepare for death? Because I lost my father. And again, there I am saying when I lost my father. So when my father died, uh, it was an accident. It was very sudden. And I'll come back to his part in my near-death experience because it does come full circle. I think I am why he showed up now, not somebody who had died before him. So can we prepare for death? Because he died and it was an accident. And then we were trying to plan his funeral. I was living in Switzerland at the time. I had flown out to New Zealand. Um, it was a plane crash that he died in. So then I jumped in a plane and flown to New Zealand, which was a very interesting concept. And we got here, we're planning a funeral. We're planning all sorts of stuff. We've got paperwork coming everywhere. There's the plane crash. There's the investigation. There's people knocking on the door. There's police visits. There's, it's just like Piccadilly Circus with people coming and going all the time. And we're trying to grieve. And I'm thinking, how could we do this better? How can we prepare for death? How can we understand what death is going to be like? And then what does a good death look like? Is it possible that there could be such a thing as a good death? So I believe it's because I believe that we can die well. I believe that death is a transition rather than a finality. And this is a very personal thing. And I completely understand people who say they don't believe that. Growing up in an atheist house, it was very much death is the end and that is it. And I think it's interesting, more than anything, I want to open the conversation and ask the questions. What a lot of my purpose that I think that I've come back for is to create spaces for conversations. So what does a good death look like and how can we die well? Which then I want to write this book because I was thinking of all the questions that I had, all the things that came up with my father when he died, thinking I don't want other people to go through that. So I put together this book called Dying Well, and this just goes through asking a whole lot of questions. It's a holistic look at death. So it looks at your spiritual beliefs, looks at what you think happens to our spirit, to our body. What do you want to happen? What happens at the end of life? Do you want to be kept alive? Some people want to be kept alive right to the very last opportunity. Others don't. So through all of this, I then end up um, training as a funeral celebrant. And also I'm in the stages of training at the moment as a death doula. 
So that is helping people to pass, helping people to transition. So I've been working with people who have got a terminal diagnosis and it's really understanding what does the rest of life look like? What is, what is your death going to look like? Do we get to the point where we can die well? So it's been, I've been asking a lot of questions and the whole time doing the podcast. So I'm looking at near death experiences and spiritually transformative experiences, but also death experiences and how the concept of death really does change the way that we live. Because I believe that when we can embrace this concept of death, we can truly, truly live. And quite a lot of people who are online today, quite a lot of people listening to this, I'm or are very interested in learning how they can fulfill their purpose. You already potentially have a spiritual focus, I would say. And so it's about understanding what this physical experience looks like while we're having this very spiritual connection. It's, yeah, again, the words, it's very difficult for me to explain. There's so much research that I've done that I have, you know, I could sit here and talk to you for hours, like I said, I'm not even sure how much time I have left, but I would rather dedicate some of this time to Q&A if that's okay with you, Yvonne, just to, to get some of those questions coming forward to help us um, get out that information because I've done a lot of interviews, I've done a lot of research, I'm doing a lot of study just to really bring out the information that people want to hear. So are you happy if we open up to some questions? Yes, that's just fine. We'll, we'll get you to stop your screen sharing. Okay. and. Uh, then I will be able to uh, bring Linda up, who will be moderating the, the question and answer period. Thank you so much. That was absolutely uh, awesome, Kirsty. Anyway, Linda, I'm going to turn it over to you for the Q&A. That sounds great. Kirsty. that was an amazing story. I'm glad you uh, gave us the time to share that. And there's still, uh, there's only a few questions. So I'm going to go ahead and kick this off with one of my own. I was okay. intrigued when you talked talked about your father when you were in your deep coma and he had no recollection of being in your room and asking for you to hold his hand. I was wondering, maybe he had a prayer that you would be holding his hand. And now that he has already died, if you have connection, just ask him, hey, do you, did you ever pray that I would hold your hand? Did you had that ever come up in dialogue? Ah. Well, again, coming from a very atheist background, my father was probably mm. the instigator of that in our family. He had very closed beliefs. So, like, I mean, I couldn't even ask him that question. That's how close he was. But I'll, I'll, I'll close the loop on that. And thank you for reminding me to bring that back to it. So he was in my near-death experience. I could feel him. Over, I could hear him over here. I could never find him. When I woke up and I said, hey, dad, did you squeeze my hand? there with me and he says no and people confirmed that he's outside the room at all times because it was just too painful and I thought that I'd gone crazy when he died like I said when he died he came back to me within so we were in Switzerland we flew out it took us probably about 36 hours to get back to New Zealand so within 48 hours because it was in the evening again when I was asleep so we're in that state where we can get messages easier I was asleep and I woke up and I felt like he was at the doorway and he came around the side of the bed to where I was sleeping. And because of the trauma of it all, we were sleeping in his bed. The bed hadn't been changed. It was the only place for us to sleep because we'd flown in from Switzerland, my husband and my daughter and I. So we're there quite literally in the bed that he slept in the last time he was in the house. My mother was in the spare room and he came around the side of the bed and he stood there and he put out his arm and I put out my arm. Now people go, did you physically see him? I don't know. It was really dark, but I feel like I saw him, but maybe I saw him with my spirit, with my mind. So I don't know. But anyway, I put my hand up. We held hands and he said to me, I'm okay. Don't worry about me. I'm okay. And we had our hands and I'm holding his hand and I've got tears just strolling, rolling down my cheeks. My husband's fast asleep next to me, of course. <laughs> so anyway, I'm there crying my eyes out and I'm just holding his hand and savoring the moment. And then somehow I might fall asleep. It wasn't that I lay there for a long time thinking about it. I fell back asleep 
And it was in the morning I rolled over. I said, honey, honey, I had this thing. Dad came and I held his hand and he said, he's okay. And it was at that moment that all of my belief systems were completely challenged because he's the atheist with zero belief and he's okay. So it challenged a whole lot, which took me on another very journey. So he's there and I'm going, okay, well, I've got that connection with him. I feel like he's around me a lot. I feel like I'm connected with him. I then realize that he's probably part of my soul team. He's probably part of my, my group because he shows up quite often. I feel like we're very, very connected. And we, we didn't necessarily get on when I was younger. I'm um, sure when I was 12 years old, things were great. But as we got older and I got more independent and I got more feisty, and we didn't always see eye to eye. So I think I learned a lot through having him in my life through that relationship, but I believe he's part of my spiritual team. And so he's here and he's directing me. He's giving me guidance. He's, it's almost like he's saying, I've got your back, part of my team. So I think that the reason I had him in my experience was because I was 12. I hadn't had anybody in my life that I knew. I'd had relatives like my grandfather, but I never met them. So I feel like he was there because he was what I would connect with. We were, at the time of his death, we were best friends. He was just my world. I was devastated because we'd sort all of our problems out. We'd become very, very, very close. And he'd said, okay, you know, I, I respect your beliefs. And I said, well, I respect yours. I think you're crazy, but I respect them. And we decided to live our lives our way but actually just really love each other and we had a very very strong strong bond to the point that I believe that I had a warning before he died I actually phoned him 24 hours before he died and he was, and he was out flying and I my mother you're not worried about him flying you know he could drop out the sky and I asked his weird questions now I didn't know at the time and then the, she said to me when I phoned her was you knew didn't you you knew and I said I didn't know but I believe that I have this connection with him. So it comes full circle. He was the one in my near-death experience because I believe he's part of my team. I believe that he was the person that I would connect with. It was what it was going to take for me to push that hard, to get through to the light, to be there. And even now I feel like he's around all the time. I talk to him all the time. I hope that answers your question, Linda. It's a bit of a long-winded answer, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it will, but it, it really answered another one I was going to follow with, so I don't need to, to expand on it. Now, I do have a question from Tim, and this yeah. is a little bit earlier in your discussion and kind of hit, it on, hit on it at the end. He says, how has all this affected your current feelings about death, and do you still have any fear or anxiety about it, or has that been completely erased? Yeah, thank you. It's been completely erased. I have no fear of death. I mean, I think potentially have a little fear of what would the death process be like? Oh, will it be painful? Will it be drawn out? I'm afraid of that because I don't think that we get more than we can handle. I think I get quite excited about the concept of and it sounds really crazy and that would probably be offensive to some especially if people are going through through things right now. And, you know, I do apologize if it causes some triggers or if it is touching on a nerve. I think I'm really excited. I go, oh, wow, one day I'm back to that place. But I have to stay in this physical world. Can't live dreaming of that place because where it comes back to is full circle to I believe that we're here for this very physical experience. So I have no fear of death. I certainly don't not do things in case I might die. Going through, I mean, I was really confronted with death because I was told I was a walking time bomb, 12 years old. I've now got no hair on the side of my head. I mean, I looked like a dribbled like a newborn. I still trip over my foot. I still walk into doors. I still am nuts. But back then, I was confronted with every single day. If I get too excited today, I could die. If I do something, I could die. When I got in that plane to fly to London, um, yeah, fly to London for the trip, I could die. And so I was confronted every single day. So I lived every single day like it was my last. 
without actually doing anything interesting, without doing anything exciting. So all I could do in those moments really was just connect spiritually and go, okay, what do we need to do? How can I be who I need to be, even though I'm constrained physically and I didn't know, we didn't know whether I do this, we didn't know whether I would die. And it sounds so dramatic and I look back and go, oh, but it kind of wasn't that dramatic. But actually, that was what we're told. At any point, my brain could go off and I wouldn't survive. So became very familiar with death, familiar with we have to have this physical experience, but we have to have it connected and we have to be kind to people, live with love. And these are a lot of the things, the themes, that the episodes that I've done, interview near-death experiences, very, very similar things of let's be kind, let's treat each other well, let's embrace life rather than focus on death so I hope that makes sense I hope that's helpful yeah I found that gave a lot of clarity um Yvonne's asking if you could share just a little bit more about how you think we can prepare better for death yes very good question I think preparing better for death is talking about it is coming to terms with the concept so like I say my father when he did die it was an accident nothing was prepared I mean I had a will and things like that but when we play funeral we had no clue what to do what was his song that he wanted did he want flowers did he want this did he want that did he want to be cremated did he want to be buried there are so many questions do you know how to find all of his things did he have investments that we didn't know about did he have all of his belongings and his fears tidied up there were so many things that we had to look into but we're also placing insurance claims because of the accident there's a um, investigation going on into the accident so every day there's new paperwork and we're trying to find things so making insurance claims we need to know everything had that been pre-written and put in one place we would have known had we had an understanding of what for his funeral would have taken off a lot of the planning it would have dedicated a lot more space to being able to grieve to focus because if you have lost somebody quite often you'll know that the time straight afterwards is very very busy because you've got things to do things to organize stuff going on the doors knocking people are bringing meals people are bringing flowers which is fabulous it's wonderful but you're not in a place where you're grieving. It's almost surreal. And then you have the funeral and then it quietens right down and then the grief kicks in. But I think if we can tap into some of that, if we can tap into what's going in by being more prepared, then it's going to make that process a whole lot easier. So how do we prepare? How do we die well? It's about having the conversation. It's about people understanding what it is you want. So I've been talking a lot about an example, which is an accident. But if we have a terminal illness, at what point do we want to go on life support? So at what point do we want that turned off? At what point do we want do we want to be medicated? Do you want to go the natural option? Do you want to go the medicated option? There are so many questions. And if we know what the person wants, it makes it a whole lot easier to give them what they want. And to have, I haven't quite got a term for it yet, but it's almost like funeral regret or after death regret, when you feel like you haven't done a good enough job, you haven't acknowledged that person's life well enough, and you can never go back and do a funeral again, you can never go back and fix the way that you treated that situation. This is a very real thing that I have seen quite a few times. And it really gets me because I just think, oh, imagine feeling like you didn't give your loved one the adequate send off or the right off. And I've done one with some people where they didn't want to send off. They said, just get my immediate family, my immediate five people. I want you to sit in a room and share the good memories. And that is beautiful. You know, we think ceremonies have to be this big thing, but actually it can be that if that person doesn't want something big, it's about understanding what they did want. And because I personally believe that spiritually we're around that, we don't completely go and miss out on the whole experience. And so it's about asking the questions around all of these parts of life, getting a holistic view and creating the conversations. We often go to funeral ceremonies and we hear these stories when they do the eulogy and you hear the stories and you're thinking, 
I feel like I didn't know this person. I didn't know that they went to the Queen, went to London, met the Queen. I didn't know that they jumped out of a plane. I didn't know that they did all these things. And it's in a funeral ceremony that the life comes together. But I think, why can't we celebrate these things and hear these things before it happens? And I'm all about creating the stories, bringing the stories together before it happens. So the short answer, I suppose, is creating the conversations and outlying how do we make this process easier? What are your thoughts around death? And how do we give you a really good send off? That's what makes it easier to die well. Okay. We've got uh, Samantha asking for a little bit more uh, deep reflection. It says, how would you describe the human relationship to divine love? Oh, gosh, the human relationship to divine love. I think we are all connected. We are that divine love. I think that there's a massive element of we come here for a physical experience, which is what I've been saying. And I think that we can tap into that divine love at any point that we are that divine love. I think everyone. Now I did talk about the six or seven beings that were when I was in this beautiful, bright white light. I do believe that we have soul groups, which are people that we are to a bit closer. So that all the people on this call, I believe we are all connected together in some form. We're connected through this divine love. But I think that we have soul groups, the six or seven people that we are directly connected to, and it may be more than that, I do not know. They are a part of our life continuously. They, you know, we are all connected. We maybe we come here, we reincarnate, we do life and over again with the same group of people. Maybe that group changes slightly and people come in for a time. But I believe that we're all here connected. And that the divine love is absolutely accessible to us. But the way that we tap into that is like I was saying, to be still, to connect, to not be so busy. And I'm sure you heard in the introduction that Yvonne gave me, I'm very busy. I, I mean, that was only a small bit of what I'm actually doing. I do a lot of things because I feel led to do a lot of things and a lot of different capacities for different amounts. And so if we can sit and I've got, I've got my father's chair, actually, which is in my office just behind my screen here. I sit there and I just breathe and I shut the world out. I tell my family, I'm going into my, I'm going to go meditate. And it's not sitting there cross-legged with my hands in the right position and umming and getting the note quite perfect. It's not about that, but it is about being still and it is about being taking time. And so for that divine love, I think if we can go and we can and connect or just open up, you know, open up our chakras and just be able to accept and to tap into that. And then we can take that. I do think we leak. That sounds a little bit unusual, but I think that as it goes on, we leak a little bit and it comes out. So if we can fill ourselves up and then we can leak all that good divine love around us, it will have off and it will impact others and then we come back and we fill up again and then we go and then we come back and we fill again and so I think that we're here having very physical experience connected in this divine love and that the divine love makes all of us I hope that makes sense it's available for all of us and we don't need any set experience or any set anything to be able to tap into it it's opening ourselves up and asking for asking our spirit team to come and help us and fill us and give us what we need for our life that we're living out today. Samantha sent a note. She said, thank you very much. You covered it well. Thank you. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I first started getting into all these studies, I also found out about um, having a new normal or people who are given a death sentence. They're, they've been told they have a terminal illness uh, the hereditary or otherwise, and they can have a window of when they can expect to pass. For us, we have what we call a hospice program. Does that exist in New Zealand also where the, where the individual and family are prepared? Exactly, yep. So we have hospice and we have palliative care. So palliative care is where it's long-term care. So this might be a rest home or it's where death is not imminent if you know what I mean by that like it's there's a bit of time still but it is right. at the end stages of life 
And so then we have hospice, which is you would probably go into hospice roughly around about two weeks before they expect to die. And what's really interesting is the hospices, they're the most beautiful. They are just so, oh, I just think they're lovely. Um, they're very painful places. Do not get me wrong. There is, a, I mean, death happens there. A lot of death happens in hospice. You go in there to die, basically. But it's, I'm talking with a lot of people who have done the work and training as a death doula, who is somebody who is with people right at the end of life. Through my training, I've, I've learned a lot as well. There are actually some signs that somebody might be about to die. And this is really interesting because we hear about deathbed visions where people, they might have a vision, they might see deceased loved ones, their past loved ones around them, they might start having patients. Often they'll talk about people in older clothing. So whether that's like Victorian times or, you know, the man in the bowler hat or the black cloak, people talk about seeing horses and carriages and things from past generations which I find really interesting another um, typical sign that somebody is quite close to passing is that they might be talking about they're going on the adventure they might be looking for their shoes their suitcase their tickets they're like I can't find my train tickets I need my train tickets if you're there with the, at the end of life and you're thinking there's no way you're going to get on a train there might be something bigger happening. So the best thing we can do in this situation is actually just go along with them going, oh, well, maybe they're under the bed. I'll have a look under the bed for you. Or let me have a look over here and see if they're there and play along with them because there's no point infuriating or frustrating somebody who's so close to the end of life and all they want to do is find their train tickets because that, that signifies the departure. It's a, a really interesting concept. They might have their passport. I need my passport and you're thinking there is no way because your passport, A, it's out of date probably, but you know, you've got nowhere to go. You, you're too ill and you can, you hear stories of family saying, don't be ridiculous. You're too sick, you don't need a passport. And it's, you know, have a bit of fun with them. And I think it can be really beautiful. So there's all these signs that happen within a host and the host is there to help that person as gracefully and as close to what they want as possible. So they're not there to fix them. There won't be doctors coming in to try and heal. They won't be coming from a treatment standpoint. And the hospice, it really is, okay, this is the end stages of life. So let's actually, let's do this the best that we can for you. And it's where we acknowledge the wishes. So going back to Yvonne's question was, if we don't know the wishes, the hospice can be very, very difficult environment so if we know what people want when you get to hospice what is it that you want is it about reducing the pain so is it about pain relief is it about staying alive for as long as possible or is it about something else and then looking for these signs I have to share one story with you so one of the signs that somebody's about to die or in the very coming hours usually within about 48 hours is that they'll get a sudden burst of life and I had this with my own grandmother. So we were in England and my husband and I were living over there. And my grandmother was very, very unwell. And she was about eight hours drive north from us. So we were down in North London. We drove up to see her. And the, the hospital had phoned and said, look, she's really on her last legs. I'd phoned my dad in New Zealand. We got him over. And then we all made the trip up. And we arrived to what we thought was just going to be the final hours to find her just still lying in her bed and she saw us come in and she perked up and she said oh I've been waiting for you we're going to go soon which is interesting and then she said but before I go I could murder a roast meal now she's British she wanted gravy she wanted the trimmings she wanted everything and so we were thinking how is this about to, how is she about to die she looks great she's vibrant she's communicating she's hungry so we started to ask the doctors, can we get a roast meal in for her? And they said, no, she can't. And it broke our hearts. We were so upset. We were starting to fight with the hospital saying, but if she wants a roast meal, it's going to give her energy and sustenance and it's going to be the perfect thing. And they said, she's about to die. She can't swallow properly. Her organs can't process food. She cannot have a roast meal. 
and we all cry like sob ugly crying over this we went upstairs and we were all just crying our eyes out because it was so devastating we came back downstairs and there she was still in her bed breathing but slow like hard breathing within 12 hours she died and so they knew they said look this is what happens they get a vibrant you know a second wave of life they wake up they're lucid they're able to communicate properly and perhaps this is where they're looking for their passport or their shoes or their train tickets they're able to communicate everything they need to communicate and then within about 24 hours they usually actually pass on from there so there's all of these that somebody is about to die which has been really interesting this has come out of my research the deathbed visions is very interesting because people see things and I often wonder if in the end stages of life whether it's hard to explain I don't know that we're in life we're alive 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 dead I think that maybe there's this the only word I can use is kind of like a mesh where we're in between two worlds we're going back and forth and I think that this happens for a lot of people in the late stages of life is that they'll go over there they'll get a reprieve they'll come back go over come back so I don't think it's alive 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 stop breathing dead I think there's an in-between transition that happens and that is what the hospice is for so question Linda yes we have the hospice here but this, this is a place to go to die it's not a place to go to get treatment from here there is no treatment they will not try and heal you in any kind of way so it's working in the again people may stay alive to bring the family in they may actually wait till you've left the room and then they'll die so you might be sitting there waiting and thinking I want to be with you in your last breath and the person's thinking I just want to go I don't want you to be here when I take my last breath and so there's all sorts of ways, again, back to your question, Yvonne, of understanding what does it look like to die well? We need to understand that perhaps the person wants to die alone. Perhaps they're going to wait till all the family members are there and then do it with everybody there. I personally think it's quite an honor to be with someone when they've died. I think it would be absolutely amazing. I've been down the hospice journey with my stepfather and we were with him right at the end stages and I've got this beautiful photo he he had a vibrant part of life jumped up on the bed with him we've got this photo I'm giving a big hug and he looks great but he was gone within a couple of days and you know it's a very sacred thing I think death is a very sacred concept but one that we're all going to go through none of us are getting out of here alive I mean, we don't truly die is my belief. So we get out of here alive in the way that we transition rather than stop completely. But this physical body will die and so all of us are going to go through this. So we need to be talking about it. And that's where I do the death cafes, opening up the conversation, understanding what it is to die, basically. Yeah, that's good. And that's sort of the introduction I had is, you know, hospice is accepting the new normal that there's, there's no more treatment. It's getting ready for that, for that death. Um, I, I have to share that, man, you talked about your granny wanting a roast meal. I, I think that would be my last wish too, is roast beef with Yorkshire pudding. <laughs> yeah, that's what she was asking for. They're so good though, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> she had good taste. Yeah. Okay. So I do have some questions. This is from another Linda and she asked, uh, do we have an exit time? So many times it seems people escape the exits. You know, oh. predetermined death. Yeah, see, I love this question. And this is a question that I ask all of the guests that come onto the podcast because I don't know. I ask, why didn't I die? Why do people, I mean, near death experiences, they become what more known about now I think that's probably down to the internet I think it's because it's so much easier whereas back when I had mine I'd never, I remember the first one that I heard of a New Zealander thinking oh I had that maybe I had a near-death experience but I think why do so many people come back why don't we stay dead why is this a thing I don't believe we die until it's our time to die I don't believe die early because I think that everything is perfectly orchestrated now I've talked to a lot of people who don't agree a lot of people who would say we've got complete free will here that 
you know, I, I think there are examples where maybe there are exceptions so to suicide, then potentially and it's not, you know, before their time. But I believe if we go through life and we actually just embrace life as it is, I don't know that we can die before our time. So then that makes me ask, well, when is our time? Is it when we complete our purpose? Is it when we complete certain things that already pre-written and yet we have freedom to make decisions throughout life? And that raises another really interesting concept, which are exit points. So these are times throughout our life where we could, and I think we make the decision, but it's subconscious. So that near miss of an accident, or we might have something else. I remember one time uh, that was probably about eight or nine years ago. I was at home by myself. My daughter was at school and was work, and I was eating something, and I choked, and I choked really badly, and I actually thought maybe this is my time, and I ran up to the neighbor's house. There was no one home because it was the middle of the day. And I thought I'm going to die on the doorstep, like on the stairs up to their house because the front door was up on the floor. Maybe I could die on there. And I, you know, my life, they talk about your life flashing before your eyes. It wasn't quite like that, but I thought maybe this is it. I obviously didn't die. I recovered from that. It was scary, very traumatic. It took me quite a few hours to actually get over this experience. But after, I thought maybe that was one of my exit points. So an exit point might be where we have the choice to die, where we can choose whether we have the accident and it takes us out or we have the accident and it's a near-death experience, or it might be that we completely by bypass it. So if you imagine the only way I can really explain this is like a highway. We call them motorways over here and we have the off ramps. I'm not quite sure what you call them, but the parts we can get off the highway, the freeway and and exit points almost like one of those and we can choose to keep going on life and continue living and take an exit point at the next point or maybe another one further up or maybe we actually just keep going to the end of the road and then it's we don't have a choice about whether we can or not so I'm not explaining this particularly well it's quite a quite an in-depth uh, topic but why do some people die I don't actually know I personally don't believe that we will until we have completed everything we need to I do think we come back again and I know when I interviewed Dr Yvonne that she talked about being here many 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 lifetimes I do think that that is very valid and we've just and so why do some people die I'm not quite sure I personally don't think we can until our time's up which makes me in some hand feel very much like I need to run around and complete my purpose and do everything that I possibly can but what happens in that process is I stop loving myself and love is one of the biggest things that we're here for. Love is what it's all about. So if we're loving ourselves, it's just as bad as not loving our family members or the people out there. So that's another part of that journey. But I think we need to, again, sit, connect, tap in. What am I meant to do? How do I squeeze the juice out of today? What does that look like? Who do I need to do? What do I need to do? Do I need to talk to somebody? so yeah sorry exit points I I don't think we can leave until it's our time personally we have free will along the way there are potentially exit points which we subconsciously choose along the way but I think at the end of the day no one knows when we're going to die so we need to talk about it it can happen at any time as a 12 year old who was fit healthy we had no clue that I had this deformity going on up in my brain no clue. So we just don't know what's around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. It's something that I found. I'm on an honor guard team. And even the, the young people that serve on the honor guard, they don't think about it. They don't have a will. They don't talk to the parents. They don't let them know what their desires are. So it's a family discussion issue. Yeah. Um, so we have Tamara with a question. And she's, you know, your podcast serves your community so well because it does make people start discussing what happened to him and she is asking what were you afraid of initially on coming out with your NDE story and now that you came out more fully today in a more vulnerable way how does it feel having really done it oh yes do you know I'm, I'm at a place now where well, I'm okay with it 
I'm not great with it. I still, I don't really love the limelight. I'm a total introvert and people go, but how can you be an introvert when you're in front of the screen and you're talking to us all the time? It's because I'm in front of a screen and that's safety for me. So back then, sorry, I think there's two parts to your question. Back then, what was I most afraid of when I was sharing my experience for the first time? Hello, it's a big scary world out there. I was afraid that people would think I was loopy. I was afraid that the brain injury that I have, I mean, it's only a little one. As you can see, I can do quite well in life. I was afraid that maybe, and I still have this thought all the time, what if I don't actually know how bad I am? What if I'm actually a basket case and everyone's like, oh, that crazy lady. And I actually think that I'm doing okay. You know, like it's all self-doubt. We question everything. We doubt everything. So I think in the very initial phases, I was, what are my family going to say? My family knew that I'd had an experience, but we hadn't talked about it. We'd shut everything down. And I talk about that in my first book because I knew one day I'd write a book. I knew that was going to come. And it came to the point where I actually had to go back to my family. We hadn't talked about this for oh, 25 years. Like it was always, oh yeah, Kirsty had a stroke one time. That's what we'd call it. We'd call it the stroke. And yes, she had to fly to England and my mum had to take me. And yes, she's had brain surgery. And yes, she falls over and can't see things sometimes because I can't really see either. But um, it was more about we just put it away we didn't talk about it so then when it was coming to the point where I was going to have to say hey family I'm actually going to put this out in the world I was beside myself terrified because it was going to bring things up I was thinking they're going to want to disown me am I looking for attention I certainly wasn't like I was not interested in this if that voice hadn't told me there is no I'd probably still today not have told people about it I told my husband um, my daughter knew my family knew something had happened because I'd asked my father the question but we just put the whole lot in a box and pushed it under the bed, basically. So I think when I first started to talk about it, it was that people, I don't know, I don't like talking about myself. I'm quite happy to just be the quiet one in the corner, which doesn't come across through the podcast, which is, it's a real polarity thing for me. I was quite happy to leave it alone. I was doing fine in life. I didn't need the world to know. Um. Yeah, so that was in the beginning, I felt like that. Today, I think today's okay because I've shared it on my own podcast. Very similar story, probably not as long as what this one was. I didn't go into details about my father, about going to the UK, about my grandmother's death. You know, you've got quite a lot more today. But I think back then it was when I shared it with the podcast, this was probably about four years ago now, three or four years ago. That was really, really scary because now it was going out publicly. My family knew I'd gone out public about it. Family, friends, um, these people had known about it, but now I was going out to the people that actually thought that I knew what I was talking about, which I don't, I still don't. But it was just another layer of vulnerability, but I couldn't have gone direct to sharing publicly. I couldn't have gone from nothing to sharing today. This has taken four years in the process. And I'm sure you can tell by the way that I'm talking about it when I'm talking about things and I'm saying there's no words for it, I can't quite make sense of this, that it, it gets easier, but I'm still not that comfortable with it. So I hope that helps you, Tamara. Um, yeah, I think it's important to share stories. A massive part of who I am is sharing stories. So when I first shared my story about, I didn't even share my near-death experience. That was too hard. I shared about getting sick I actually hired a coach in Sydney and I flew over to Sydney and said to this coach can you help me get my story out because I'm too scared I can't talk about this and they helped me get it out and I thought I was safe because I was in Sydney not in Auckland you know a good three and a half hour flight away but it made no difference because it eventually well quite quickly got its way back to me but this is how scared I was I couldn't do it myself I needed to get an external person to help me and I think we're all about storytelling. When I first shared about my illness and all I shared about was the, um, the first part I didn't share about going to England, just shared about how I had the surgery, basically. That was terrifying for me just to share that I'd had brain surgery. Don't ask me why. Now I look at it and go, well, that's okay. But people came up to me afterwards and said, well, I've got this story that I want to share and I don't know how. And so I could see that actually me sharing my story for the very first time, it helped other people. And it kind of grew from there as well. And um, that's where I started interviewing people who've had major life crisis moments. It wasn't around near-death experiences. It was around people who've had 
car accidents. One guy was held up at gunpoint, had cancer, had lost a child, had a house fire, all of these crisis moments in life and how they deal with them. And so I think a lot of it is in these moments, if we can share our stories, we can come to terms with our stories. Just like if we can share what a good death looks like for us, we can come to terms with what a good death looks like for us. So I hope that's even answered your question. I could talk a lot, can't I? Yeah. Well, it takes, yeah. it takes a talent. If you're going to run a podcast, it's a talent you're going to have to develop if you don't already have it. So you're doing well. Uh. Um, now, we kind of discussed about the different aspects of a hospice program, but Clara brought up a point of a program we have here in the States is called advanced care planning. Um, that's before you have to go into hospice. Does New Zealand have something like that also? So we have, we do have some degree of advanced care planning. We've got end of life planning, but to be fair, like you were saying before, the young ones aren't doing it. It kind of happens in the last moments. It happens when it's on the radar. Whereas I want to bring it before it happens. I want to bring it right back to let's talk about what you want. Let's talk about death earlier because that, you know, advanced care planning doesn't really tackle an accident. If, well, it does if you've got it sorted, but a lot of people don't talk about, they don't plan anything until there is a terminal diagnosis or there is something going on. We don't tend to plan before it happens. Maybe it's a little bit different over there. But that's sort of my gut feel here in New Zealand, possibly Australia as well, is that we, we kind of put it over to the side because it's easier just to go through life and not worry. And it's interesting because something like 75% of people think that having a will is important. And yet I think the stats are in the 20s, 20% or 25% actually have one. So there's a massive gap between thinking it's a good idea and doing it. And there's a massive gap in having an advanced care plan and, well, thinking it's a good idea, but actually having one. So where I feel very passionate is to open up the conversation and talk to people before we get to the end moments, before we get to that crisis moment. Let's do that now. So the advanced care planning is very, very important. It's outlining what you want for your death, what it looks like, what a good death looks like. So it's very, very I wasn't aware that these things even existed when I wrote my book, Dying Well. It was literally just what was in my mind. I wrote down all of my questions of what I thought we could possibly tackle. It comes into some of the happier stuff as well, because, you know, death, not that it can be a happy moment because it's loss and it's grief and it's devastating. But if we can infuse little elements of joy into it, then I think we can make it a lot lighter than it than it potentially could be so in the book we talk about what are some of the funny moments what are the family jokes what are the the good things we talk about what was it like when you first fell in love and you know it's, it's it goes outside of the advanced care plan it talks about the personal stuff because we're all beings we're all people and death can be very clinical it can be very sterile and it can be all about the process but they're still a person. They're still, they've still got emotions. They've still got stories. And I, you know, I love being with older people. I love being with people that are retired. I've got a friend, he's 83, 84. He lives around the corner. I love hearing his stories because he's so vibrant and full of life. And I think it's such a waste to lose that. We lose so much of the stories and the goodness because we don't get it out. So I want to embrace these stories before it's too late. And as an individual, we might think, well, our story means nothing. And actually that goes back to Tamara's question. I kind of felt like my story meant nothing and my experience meant nothing. But now that I followed this voice, which keeps coming back to me and directing me in all sorts of things, I realized that sharing my story has been able to help people. And it's been able to impact people's lives in a positive way and that it's no longer about me. So if we can get these stories before people die and share nuggets of their life and their wisdom and their teachings and learnings that can have a positive impact for future generations or future people and it's no longer about the person needing to share their story I'm not sure if that makes sense but we need to share our stories advanced care plans are, are very very important but I think it's got to go beyond that we've got to remember that people are still people not clinical cases in a bed who are about to die. There's a lot we can learn from people in the end stages of life. 
Well, that's true. And, um, you know, I heard in your story how much you learned by doing research. And as you were relating the story of your grandmother and how lucid she was, no, it was just two years ago, 20, um, 24, maybe 36 months ago, I heard for the first time about this phenomenon called terminal lucidity, exactly yeah. like your grandmother went through where you go to visit, and you, you got your hankies ready and they're there and they want to chat quite a bit. Yeah. So um, I just want to share that we have no more questions. We have a lot of accolades and a lot of words of appreciation for you sharing what you have shared. And uh, oh, we are hoping you. you the best for the continued success of your program where you live. And I'm getting ready to turn this over to Robert. Uh, but I want to thank you. I've enjoyed chatting with you. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for joining in. I hope that's been helpful. I'm always happy to chat further. And yeah, there's lots of experiences and researchers, um, personal stories that I've researched through the podcast. So a lot of life lessons there. And let's just live lives of love and kindness is my main thing. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsty. It was fantastic. You did a great job. Thank you for a great presentation. And um, just want to do a, a few housekeeping things as we're closing up. Just to remind everybody that SAI has online speaker events the third Saturday of each month. They're always free. Our next SAI Presents event will be Saturday, November 20th. We have a special veterans, military and first responders program event in recognition of Remembrance Day or Veterans Day, which is every November. And we have uh, Ben Riggs who's going to be talking about STEs and the military. It'll be a great presentation. If you know anybody that's a veteran that uh, may want to tune in, it, it's worth it. He'll do a great job. And SAI is hosting our next uh, SAI Experiencers Sharing Circle on Saturday, November 6, 2021. Now, the SAI Experiencers Circle, Sharing Circles, are always the first Saturday of every month. And if you're going to take part in those, the last one, um, we actually had 24 people that could not get in we have we have rules set and i think yvonne could talk about this a little bit more clear than, than possibly i can but once we lay the ground rules for our event we do not allow anybody else to enter so uh we we close it but 24 people missed out and i mean there were people from all over the world my group they were i had somebody from the netherlands somebody from Argentina, uh, somebody from Mexico, uh, Australia, plus the United States and Canada. So it's really, a, it's really neat to bring everybody together. And we have Tamara Calder Richardson in our audience. Uh, she's going to be speaking in December <clears throat> and uh, she's on our advisory board and our marketing chair. Uh, I'm looking forward to her presentation. And also in our audience today, we have Lewis Brown Griggs, who's going to be speaking uh, in January. So uh, I just waved everybody. Uh, so we have that lined up. And our SAI monthly Spanish language events are starting November 2021. And I mean, this is something that I think is going to appeal to a, a good portion of the world. The Spanish language events will be held on the second Saturday of each month. Uh, Anna, Anna uh, Cecilia Gonzalez is the chair of the SAI Espanol Spanish uh, Language uh, Committee. And we also have Dr. Ingrid uh, Ancala and Francisco Valentin uh, are on that committee. And uh, there's going to be some great events for the Espanol part of the world coming up. And in fact, our first event will be Francisco Valentin will be the first speaker on November 13th, 2021. And our Spanish language 
experiencers sharing circles will start December 11th, 2021 in Espanol. So please register for all the English and Spanish events and sharing circles on our website. And Dr. Quezon, Yvonne, I'm gonna give it to you and thank, thank you everybody for coming today. Really great to see everybody. And oh. Kirsty, thanks again for your great presentation. Thank you, Robert. And I want to say thank you too to Kirsty for an absolutely fabulous presentation. I thought your story was uh, incredible. I'm, I was really touched with um, um, the courage you had and the positive frame of mind that you had when healing from your, um, from your uh, brain surgery, brain injury. And I know there are others that were listening today. I too have recovered from a traumatic brain injury and Lewis Brown Griggs, who will be speaking in January, he's recovered from a traumatic brain injury. So um, I would just affirm Kirsty uh, that on a personal level, I could really understand with some of the insecurities when you're first coming out, uh, mm -hmm. but then, uh, that spirit taps us and says, well, there's work for you to do. You got the voice yeah. telling you to do your Let's Talk Near Death podcast. And I got the voice telling me start Spiritual Awakenings International. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, anyway, thank you, Kirsty. It was a fabulous presentation. Um, I want you. to remind everybody, thank you for coming. And I remind everybody that um, the video from this will be posted on our SAI website in a couple days and the videos from all of our events uh, do get posted on our SAI website on the videos page. You can watch them for free. Uh, and then later, about six months after the event, they get posted on our SAI YouTube channel. So if you're scrolling on YouTube, subscribe to our SAI YouTube channel and, and you'll be uh, able to watch our videos there too. And there are people watching on Facebook today. We were also live streaming on Facebook. So any of you there who've not yet uh, signed up uh, to for SAI to be on our mailing list of events, uh, check out our beautiful website. It's uh, Spiritual Awakenings International org and it's free to be on our mailing list and all of our online events are free and then the last thing i wanted to say is i invite all of you to please make a donation to spiritual awakenings international if your heart so moves you hopefully it does we are uh operating on a donation based model so we count on your donations to um, cover our operating costs rather than charging for events so with that, I would like to say thank you again, Kirsty. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I believe we have people from uh, six or seven countries present today. That is awesome. Uh, England, North America, and down in uh, uh, New Zealand, so in Hawaii. <laughs> so we had lots and lots of people, Canada, the US. So anyway, thank you, everyone, for coming. We'll see you next time. So goodbye. Au revoir. Auf Wiedersehen, adios, buenos tardes, arrivederci, dach, farvel, ciao, aloha, and as they say in Hawaii, kia ora. <laughs> Bye, everyone.